Hello, hello. I am Dara Tucker, uh, the executive editor of Bookster, and I welcome you all to another edition of Bookster Talks. I know it's been a while, but I promise it's going to be worth the wait because I'm beyond excited to be talking to Barbara Sontheimer. She's a fascinating historical romance fantasy author, uh, and today we'll be talking about her book, Victor's Blessing. Uh, we'll be getting to know her writing process, but most interestingly, we're going to get to know the person behind the writer. How are you doing, Barbara? I am fine, Dara. How are you? I'm good, too. So let's begin with uh, a little about yourself. Tell us about yourself and tell us, uh, you know, where you grew up, uh, a little about your background and if that's had any impact on your writing as well. It had a lot of impact. I grew up in Missouri. So one of the reasons I focused my novel in Missouri was because at least I wouldn't have to um, research the foliage. That's one of the things that was wrong in the Netflix series Ozark. The foliage and the docs were all wrong because it was actually filmed in Atlanta. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, I started writing at nine and uh, my poor mother would have to listen to all my stories. So uh, God rest her. I, I hope she's happy now looking down. <laughs> so um, you've, you've had a successful career. Tell us something about your career before you decided to get into writing. And um, also now that you've launched your writing career, has your you know, career before you became an author uh, have any impact on uh, or did it you know any aspect of your career before inspire your writing? Well I was in sales I've never done anything but sales and you would think in sales you know you have to be forceful and kind of direct and in your face and I'm really not like that at all it was all a facade I did it just to feed my kids <laughs> because really I'm kind of shy, believe it or not. I mean, I'm yappy, but I'm shy. So writing for me was the perfect thing because I could be involved in all these things, but not really have to be there with other people. I mean, you can have so much fun with a piece of paper and a pencil that didn't come out right. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, but and and did you uh, think about writing while well, now that you mentioned you know your uh, sales was your vocation because you you know um, it was more of a job than oh, yes. you know, something totally uh, a job you know is is writing your passion and did you think about writing back then did you start writing this book then I like I said I started at nine. Uh, I always thought I wanted to be a writer, but you know, uh, self doubt is an evil ugly monster that inhabits most of us. And I think I had an extra big, ugly, evil monster. And uh, I started writing this um, about 15 years ago, but the self-doubt will eat you alive. And it wasn't until my uh, last son, my third child left the house that I really got serious and uh, tried to, to see if I could do it, if I could share my story with people because I found it so much fun to write. I hope they would think it was that much fun when they read it. I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to go through your book and um, it is beautifully written. We will talk more about that. But before we get into the details of, you know, um, I, I would also want to know how did you address writing blocks, if any? Didn't have any. I, I always knew what was going to happen. Uh, the only problem I had was I knew that the way the story had to go, but I didn't want it to go that way. And I walked around the house outside in the winter for about two hours one day, trying to figure out a way to make the story end a different way, but it wouldn't have been the same story. And so I ultimately decided to do it the way I'd always envisioned it. So. Um, and did you have a sort of a process that you followed or did you just let it flow? I always, I've read a lot as most, most uh, writers are readers. 
And I would watch a movie or read a book and think, you know, that that character so and so wouldn't do that. That was ridiculous. That was stupid. Or oh my gosh, it could have been so much better if they'd done X, Y, Z. So that's when I started just formulating these scenarios in my head. And, um, you know, once you get down behind that computer, I, I mean, my fingers couldn't keep up. I was just, and they seemed very real to me. They still do. <laughs> and I mean, each character is, you know, so thoughtfully written, I must say. Uh, speaking about the backdrop, what inspired you to, you know, want to write about, um, you know, the novel is set in obviously the Civil War era, right? So what was your inspiration? How did you decide it had to be in a certain time period? Well, it was two reasons. Obviously, I have passion about the Civil War. It was such a tumultuous time in America. And most of the Civil War novels out there are written about the maligned South, no offense South, but the North suffered too, and only about beautiful Southern bells and how their, their uh, sweethearts didn't come home. But there's a whole other half of the country that had all kinds of struggles as well. So I didn't want to write a story about just a, a beautiful Southern belle and you know her, her man in gray. So I wrote it from the Norse perspective and, and, you know, what happened to them and the struggles within Missouri itself, which was a, a technically a slave state, but we didn't, we had very little slavery actually in the state of Missouri, but it was technically a slave state, but there was a lot of unrest and it, it was a mess. And um, it's also uh, set in, um, and we mentioned also said in Missouri and uh, yes. you are a Missouri native. I am. So uh, how, uh, you know, what part of your own life inspired certain elements in the novel? Was, was there some kind of, you know, did you borrow from your real experiences at all or? No, I, I pretty much made it all up but I took characters that I would have found interesting and, you know, wove them into this story in St. Genevieve. And I picked St. Genevieve, Missouri, because uh, I'm actually, I live in the greater St. Louis area. St. Louis was too big a town. And then there's a little town down the river on the Mississippi called Kimswick, which when I did research didn't exist. So I was like, well, I can't use that town. It wasn't there yet. So I landed on St. Jen, and the more research I did on St. Genevieve, it is a, and it's still there today, it's a wonderful little town, French, German, cosmopolitan, Spanish, Indian people. It's a really neat town. So I, um, you know, I've led a pretty dull life as far as, you know, adventures. So mm -hmm. I really just make them up in my head behind my computer. <laughs> but, um... We also see that kind of diversity in within the novel also. Um, even when you look at the characters, the main characters, Victor, for example, without spoiling it for the audience, if you could speak a little about Victor and, you know, maybe what was the inspiration behind, uh, you know, because I also read in one of the reviews, uh, someone said, if I could make a movie on this novel, I would cast uh, Jason Momoa. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well I don't know about you um my husband's not real tall and uh sorry honey but you know I love tall men and the Osage Indians at the time that were in the area um and this is you know uh 1830 most men at that time in history were about five foot five and the Osage Indian were routinely over six feet tall now that's a fact I didn't make that up so I just gave him a little bit more height and made him, you know, half Indian because who doesn't love a handsome, tall blacksmith? I mean, I, 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 obviously I'm very enamored of him, if you couldn't tell. I think we all are uh, pretty sure uh, the rest of you, you know, when you do get to reading the novel, I'm sure you will be too. Um, were there any... Uh, also, were there any celebrities in your mind that you thought of when you were writing about Victor? Just Jason, were... just <laughs> Mr. Momoa. And, you know, Jason, if we could make this a limited Netflix series, that would be oh, great. Yeah. But 
no, I really, I just, I made it all up. Um, I gave my character, Selena, six siblings. I also have six siblings. And um, only to keep the birth order straight in my head did I model them over uh, about my siblings, but they are not my siblings. They would be angry if they were. So no, I just did that with birth order in my head. And obviously people had a lot of children at the time. So I, that's the rest of it all just came out of my, in fact, my husband said that to me the other day because it's um, kind of a, a weighty book. It's, it's a, he said, and all that came out of your head. And he was just yes. amazed. And I said, yes, it did. <laughs> the man who won't read it, but he doesn't like to read. And I said, really? <laughs> or maybe because of the inspiration behind Victor. He doesn't, well, never mind. I won't go there, but he's okay with it all. <laughs> but, and you can tell we're all enamored by Victor now that I'm, you know, getting back to the character again. Um, Victor is also a very humble and selfless character. So were there more, you know, inspirations behind, you know, or, or you know, what was your thought process? Um, we'd like to know how does an author think when you're, you know, deciding on what a character will be like? We well, wake up in the middle of the night with ideas and you get up and you write them down. And the next thing you do is you look up and you're like, oh, that orange ball in the sky is the sun. Wow. It, you, you know, I, I almost feel like somebody else wrote it because when I started writing it, I knew how it was gonna end. I knew everything was gonna happen. It just came out. It was just, it was, I've never had that much fun in my life other than uh, marrying my husband and having <laughs> my three children Riding Victor's Blessing has been the best thing that's ever happened to me. I've never had this much fun. Not even um, a ghost hunt or an adventure like that because <laughs> influences. I mean, at least I would have guessed you, um, you know, it seems like you have an interest in the supernatural. Uh, yes. Okay. Well, that was really all my mother's doing. So the inspiration for the whole book was sitting down with my mother, who was very, very ill and bedridden. And, uh, you know, what do you talk about after a while? So she was talking about uh, General Washington during the Revolutionary War and how with the Continental Army, he had to allow them to go home in the spring to put the crops in. Okay. And uh, she said, well, wouldn't it be cool if one of those soldiers had gone home to put in the crops and then the year later, his wife would find out that it wasn't him. And I said, oh, mom, can I steal that? <laughs> That's quite interesting. I think it's these little things that really, you know, all put together, of course, each individually really sets your novel apart. And um, even... Um, you know, the whole plot, right? It's, of course, it's it's historical romance, but it's not your stereotypical, you know, uh, civil war tropes, right? There, it, it is different from uh, most civil war novels. Uh, would you like to, you know, speak a little about the tropes in your novel? Well, right, it, that's exactly what I was trying to do. First of all, it's from the Norse perspective. Um, it's, it's uh, from his wife's perspective, and she's just a regular person. They're, they, they, they're well off, but they're not plantation owners. My uh, care, Victor is a half Osage blacksmith who, whose own mother was an Indian slave, which happened in that time period, did all the research. And I wanted to talk about how the people of the times would have felt about it, because we all know that slavery is wrong and we're all supposed to be against it and 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 we are don't get me wrong but there was a lot of nuances to it so i tried to show conversations between real people that would have been talking about the struggles because let's face it if you if you had a person that's been enslaved and then all of a sudden you free them as they rightly should be freed that's just the beginning of of a new hardship for them what do they do they, they don't they don't have a home they don't have a a job. They don't have uh, maybe any skills. So Victor talks about a lot about that. And I was trying to show the, the other side. Yes, slavery is wrong. 
you know, we all, it's an ugly part of American history that today we still, de still deal with, but I was trying to get in a little deeper to it, to how the people would actually feel on both sides of the issue. And uh, Missouri being the slave border state that it was, it was very, very conflicted within Missouri. And I can imagine, you know, uh, just as reading this novel also evokes, you know, multiple emotions, I'm sure as an author as well, right? You must have gone through a whole emotional journey through writing. Well, it was horrifying. I would read some of the things that were happening in the country. It's just terrifying. Um, I actually got the inspiration from Victor from a true slave story. I can't remember the gentleman's name. His name was Nate, and he was a huge blacksmith. And uh, abolitionists, abolitionists came for him at his cabin, and he held the door closed for hours. Eventually, they broke in and got he and his family. But just the idea that his brute strength was trying to keep people away, and they were trying to do him harm, and he had done nothing wrong. I mean, it's just... Um, yeah, there was, there was lots of Sumner and Brooks, uh, the North Carolina and the other uh, Senator where he beats him until he's unconscious on the uh, Senate floor. I mean, those are real stories. These are things that happened and you don't get that from, um, when you, when you take American history, you get a very short snapshot of the civil war and there's just so much more. So I didn't focus as much on the big battles like Bull Run and Manassas and Antietam and Shiloh. I may mention those, but I picked out the little battles because let's face it, all battles are bad. Yeah. All casualties are heartbreaking. True. And um, it was interesting to see how you, you know, uh, you did get into, you know, the lives of a lot of characters, not just you know, highlighting, uh, you know, in most novels you get to see there's the main character and then, you know, there are other characters. You tried to make it more as real as possible um, while narrating, you know, uh, the Civil War from a different perspective, differently than it has been told so far. So that was really interesting. And see. I did it on purpose. I don't know if you've ever read Maeve Vinci. She's an um, Irish author. She has since passed away, sadly. When you used to pick up one of her meaty novels, you would be introduced to 20 characters. And the beginning, you're like, holy cow, I can't even. But, but, you know, another 30 pages into the book, you knew who they were, you cared about them, and they would be secondary characters to the story, but they added to the richness of it, and you cared about what happened to them. So, because with Victor and Selena, I could only tell one story. If I had secondary and tertiary characters, I could tell, you know, many more stories. So that, that, was, that was the reason, and that's why it's so long. <laughs> well, it does, it did feel like a, you know, complete novel in itself, but um, would we be expecting a, you know, another, is this the beginning to a series? You know, I actually thought about that. And uh, there's a character in it called Arvelin. And mm -hmm. um, I, I might follow her on, but I'm currently working on a, I'm gonna do a three part series about, um, this is true too. In 1721, ships came from France with young brides for the settlers in um, what's modern day Biloxi now. And, you know, they just got off the boats and the priests and the sisters tried to marry him off. And those, um, uh, I think it was 86 women on the first boat, the Le Berlin, and I may mispronounce that because I don't speak French. They became the founding families, which is now modern day Louisiana and New Orleans and Biloxi. So they can trace those, um, I think it's 84 women's lineage back. So I thought that was fascinating, so. That's what I'm working on now. Interesting. Um, and coming back to, uh, you know, I just can't obviously think back about how beautifully you've, you know, written the characters, written the, you know, story. Um, I was intrigued particularly by, you know, how Victor's Blessing is, it can be defined as a love story at the same time a family saga. 
So did you always, you know, kind of know the scope of Victor's blessing? Did you, or did the timeline, you know, take uh, shape on its own, evolve on its own as you went along? No, I, I, I always knew what was going to happen. I knew the beginning, the middle, the end. Um, Margaret Mitchell, not that I'm comparing myself to Gone with the Wind, but she said the, the last like four chapters of Gone with the Wind wrote themselves. And again, I don't want to compare myself to her, but it, 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 I knew exactly what was going to happen and it, it, it was the right thing to do. And I, I wanted to tell a, a really good story. Um, I had a, a friend read it a couple of weeks ago and uh, she texted me the other day and she said, I'm still thinking about Victor and Selena. And I took that as the biggest compliment I could ever get. I mean, that, that's all I wanted. I want to give you a couple hours of, in, of enjoyment and to learn some really cool, odd things about the Civil War. And, you know, I, I, I was just, I was enthralled. So <laughs> thanks, Mary Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> and the book is also about I mean, it, it leaves you with hope, right? Uh, there is this constant theme of, or running theme of, I would say, second chances. Yes. So tell us more about that, because, you know, that's, that is a very strong theme that we see in, in your novel. Well, uh, I would say hope and forgiveness, because let's face it, forgiveness is the right thing to do, but it's hard. It is very difficult at times when you've been wronged to truly forgive. And I was just trying to show that when you truly forgive, it really does free you. And I did uh, try to end the novel on not a sad note. I mean, I don't think it is. I, I don't feel that way. Um, and that there, there are better things and good people do prevail. And, you know, such as Victor, he was just such a good human being. So, and by his forgiveness, his whole town is better. That is true. So, um, in, uh, you know, I want to know a little more about your writing process as well, you know, because I'm so intrigued, uh, as I'm sure our audience is. Um, this is a long read. And also in, you know, uh, I'm sure it's taken a lot of research um, uh, would you want to tell us more about, you know, were you always a history buff or did you go into like, you know, actively, uh, go back and research a lot for this book? What was your process? What was your research process like? It research is wonderful and very painful. And plus you can get down rabbit holes. Okay. You've picked up this book and you're going to research how they make clothes white in, you know, 1830s America. And then pretty soon you're into borax and and, and the other uh, I want to say was indigo and and all these other things. I I enjoyed the research, but you do go down rabbit holes, and then I would find something so compelling that I'd try to find a place to put it in because I thought it was so wonderful or shocking or um, endearing that I wanted to put it in. So I mean I I've got I'm surrounded by research books. Um, and I, you know, I've been at this a little while. I mean, my, uh, my one kid was in second grade and uh, I actually met a friend that way. I walked into violin lesson class. Oh God, second graders playing violins, but that's another story. And I had research books with me and she was also a writer and that's how I met her. And we've, um, she, she's done a lot of uh, edits for me, but the research is painful and wonderful at the same time. But I was originally going to be a librarian in college and then the Dewey Decimal System took me down. Then my next major was history and the ancient Mesopotamians took me down. So I ended up being a Spanish major and no, I'm no longer fluent in Spanish, but I always had a love for a library's history and books, so. Hmm. That explains, cause you, uh, <laughs> you know, in the book there, there are so many things that you, you know, a reader would point out to and say, this is so accurately written. This feels so real because, you know, it is. Say, for example, even uh, St. Genevieve, you know, what you've, um, the way you've, you know, included uh, 
you know, little elements that are, that make uh, it so close to reality. Uh, even something like, you know, childbirth at that time. Um, I think uh, the reality of childbirth in that period was an important part of the story, right? Yes, it was. Um, you know, how did you, your research, how did you research on, you know, all those, I mean, I'm sure all those, you know, topics are out there, uh, but did you also, you know, go on conducting interviews? Did you get into like, you know, the details of, you know, meeting people, speaking to them about it and, well, I did. Uh, I, I went to St. Genevieve more than once, obviously, and uh, walked around the town and bought books and did my research. And as far as childbirth, you know, all you have to do is read some of the literature and how the, the sad ideas that they had with bleeding people and not letting in fresh air because of bad humors and all those things, you know, the doctors meant well, but... Mm -hmm they just didn't have the knowledge. I mean, you know, the dark ages, we lost so much knowledge, unfortunately. And I just, um, you know, not to tell too much, but when I gave birth to my own children, some of the nurses had me doing things that I thought were ridiculous and were fabulous. I mean, I'm like, okay, that's a great idea. Let's walk around the room. Might slip out here at the end, but uh, so, and so many times with childbirth, um, you know, they make you lay down really gravity should help you give birth. And so anyway, um, but yes, I did a lot of research. Um, um, I, I looked at a lot of medical dictionaries, believe it or not, a lot of, uh, and, and looked at problems and things and thought, oh, well, you know, that makes sense to me. And a lot of the people didn't have the knowledge and then they meant well, but you know, they didn't even know to wash their hands. I mean, so things like that. Wow. So, um, okay, uh, let's, I know uh, I'm suddenly jumping to something lighter, but let's move on to audience questions. We already have some questions in. Siomara asks, uh, she's interested in knowing um, what a typical writing day looks like for you. What motivates you to write? Because it's so much fun and I get to sit down and go crazy. Um, it's like being a dream, being asleep, but being awake, I can make my characters do anything. I, I heard a fellow writer say the other day, writers are really cruel people because we create people we love and then we do terrible things to them. You know, things happen in their lives. Um, and I don't mean to be evil, but, uh, I, I get up, I walk five miles. I sit down in my office, which, um, there's pictures of it on my website is a actual closet with no windows. And I'm in there with an auric vacuum and uh, folding chairs. And uh, people say to me, oh, don't you need inspiration? Don't... I'm like, no, it's all in here. I mean, I, a window would just distract me. And it has a door to keep my husband out. So that's important. <laughs> okay. Um, Pulani asks, how much of your actual life found its way into the book? I know you've already uh, spoken a little about it, but... Um... If you could tell us, was it, was it, you know, a lot of it or? Well, my, my, my family, the number of them, and you, you can't be, uh, and I'm the youngest of seven, which gives you, then you understand why I'm a little bit the way I am, because I was always trying to get some attention. I'm here. I'm here. No, I, I've had a pretty dull life, really. I, I just made it all up. Like my husband said, that all came out of your head. I mean, you know, we've all had heartbreaks and and things like that but no i i have uh, my husband is not six foot five he is not a blacksmith so and my, my my sister is my best friend she is not carlene i love her her name is elizabeth so <laughs> no it's not really me I, I made it all up i think as a fellow creative person i would say that that is true right uh, for us it's either inspiration or an escape or both and, it, and it's so much fun. It is when you think, and we've all written bad stuff too. Oh, believe me, I'll come back to my computer. And I'm like, I'm so glad no one can see that delete. Oh, it's still there. More delete. I mean, you paint pages and you hit that delete button. You're like, no one will ever know 
that was so bad. So everything isn't good. I mean, and I know it and I know when it's really bad. Um, what I don't know very often is when it's good. I have to have other people tell me that. So that's what's been nice about being able to be published because it was a validation of something that I worked extremely hard on. But um, I know uh, we've learned that, you know, most, most of your writing comes from, you know, right, from, from the inside, right? But um, when you do find inspiration, so Joyce is asking, besides your own life, where else do you find inspiration? I would say history then, like the story of those brides that came over and uh, their actual records were lost for 225 years in the French archives. So it's just now been known that these 84 brides came from France, you know, and they were um, very, very impoverished women and they were just forgotten. So to me, I'm like, wow, 84 women that came over and became the founding families of Louisiana and, and did all this stuff. I, I, to me, that's cool. Yeah, that is impressive. So Erin asks, um, as a debut author, what advice would you give to an aspiring writer or working on their first novel? Um, you're gonna have a lot of uh, roadblocks and the, the worst ones are in your head. Mm -hmm. At least if you're like I am, because I was convinced I couldn't do this and there was no way and I didn't have the talent. But uh, if you're really enjoying it as I was, if nothing else, you can write it for yourself. I, I mean, I, I, I found it uh, uh, very embarrassing to let my work out. It was almost like, you know, I was sending out my little toddler into the world and people were going to you know, beat up my toddler, you know, but you just have to let it go. And we're glad you did. Because... <laughs> <laughs> my little tiny tap toddler. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Griffin asks, um, do you have a favorite book or genre and uh, do the things you like to read influence your writing and this novel? Oh gosh. Yes. Uh, I loved Frankenstein by uh, Mary Shelley, who didn't. Uh, Withering Heights. I mean, gosh, I loved Rosamond Pilcher, Maeve Binchy, uh, Kalu Husani. Uh, absolutely. I, I read those books and I'm just, you know, sometimes when you're reading something and it's so good and you put the book down and you think, and you just let it mingle in your brains, the words they've said and the images they've evoked. And it's, it's so much fun. We've all had that book that when you finally close the last page, you're, you're sad that it's over. So yeah, I, I, I love to read. I would I would read more than do anything else other than write. Tell us a little about your cover. Because uh, Jaden's, uh, sorry, yes, Jaden's asking. Uh, the book has a very simplest, simplistic but very beautiful cover. Thank you. Uh, and it's eye-catching. And uh, he wants to know, how did you create the book's title? Uh, was this an idea you always had? Did it reveal itself as you were writing? I knew the book's title before I wrote it, and I never changed. And when you read it, you will you will know why. Um, the The title, the cover, I can't take any credit for. I, I gave Atmosphere Press, which is my publisher, some guidelines, and uh, Ronaldo Alves came up with it, and uh, he gave me four choices. And uh, of course, I sent it to my family my poor family, and they all overwhelmingly picked this cover. And um, I didn't want it to be, you know, the romance where you just see the Southern Belle, you know, on the steps of the mansion, because that's not what it was. And it's, you know, it's, um, I mean, it is a love story, but it hopefully is so much more than that. Nothing wrong with love stories. Um, but I wanted to tell a bigger story about the time and the struggles. But yeah, I was very happy with the cover. I thought, I thought Atmosphere did a very good job. They did. And uh, we do have some comments as well. Uh, Maddie says, I just love you so much. Uh, Jed says, your research is impeccable and inspiring. Uh, Kylie says, never really realized how romanticized the Civil War was until now. Your take on it is so interesting. Uh, Mary says, enamored with Victor is exactly correct. So I'm guessing Mary's read the book. Yes. Uh, getting back to 
The questions Danny asks, can I ask how you went ahead researching and portraying native culture and perspective? Did you speak to any Native Americans to get some perspective? I did all I I did that all by research by book, to be mm -hmm. honest. Again, even though I was in outside sales, believe it or not, I'm kind of shy. And I I just didn't know how to go about walking up to someone and saying, how do you feel? But, you know, deep down, we're all the same inside. We're all afraid, scared, worried, worried, glad. And I just did a bunch of research on the Osage Indian as much as I could on the culture with the Dawn chant and the, the kind of tattoo that Victor had. Um, um, it would, it would, uh, and they're indigenous, or at least they were, there was a whole lot of them in Missouri. So there was a, there was a lot of research and I just read and read and read. And I hope I did a, a good job. I, I'm certainly not trying to um, act like I know what would feel like. I was trying to get, first of all, I'm in the head of a six foot five blacksmith man. So, you know, if I can do that, hopefully I can portray other things, but um I, I love the Osage Indians because um, they were so big physically and uh, they weren't very uh, menacing. They were a nice culture that um, th they lived with within St. Genevieve pretty peacefully. I mean, that's that says a lot. So here it's their area and the French come in, then the Spaniards come in, then the Germans and the they, I'm not saying they didn't have any troubles, but there were no raids and things like that. So anyway, I, I hope I did it justice. I tried. My heart was in the right place. And Lauren asks, what's next for you in the realm of writing? Just the, uh, the three-part trilogy about the brides. I've got about uh, 50 pages done and um, I'm gonna start it in uh, 1721. Then I'm going to fast forward to at, at uh, 1920, Biloxi was the seafood capital of the United States. They aren't anymore, but they had their heyday. And wouldn't that be fun to write about? And of course, I'm going to follow three of uh, four of these brides and then their granddaughters and then their great granddaughters. So that's my that's my plan. And uh, um, I'm still in the research stage, which means for me buying tons of books and destroying them with outlining and turning down pages and sticky notes. Great. Um, <laughs> we have another <laughs> comment in. Uh, Lolly says, uh, she thanks you. She says uh, she's still reading and learning a lot so far and says it has my attention. That's, that, that's a huge compliment. <laughs> Because there's a lot of new books published every day in America. And if I'm going to ask somebody to part with some money, I, I want to give them their money's worth. I, I wanted to give them a good story that would make them laugh, cry. And like you said, have some hope and um, hope at the end. So th that's what I that's what I endeavor to do. Mm -hmm. And um... Oh, Siomara asks, creating a story from scratch is impressive. How long did it take you to complete the book? <laughs> well, my youngest was in second grade and he's a fireman now. <laughs> <laughs> About 15 years. A long time. That is a long time. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it, you know, again, in... I am in awe of, you know, how, uh, you know, the amount of research that's gone into, you know, writing the book, even writing each and every character, each and every element that you've, you know, um, it, it shows that there's a lot of research, there's a lot of thought that go that's gone into, you know, it's not just, even as a love story, it's not just like your, you know, uh, other love stories, um, you're try you've you've you know also portrayed characters from you know as layered personalities not just as you know black or white well we're so all humans are complicated yes they really are and when they do things that you know oh gosh that's a bad thing to do if you kind of give them a reason and and, and we've all made mistakes mm -hmm. we've all done some things we aren't proud of and that's what I was trying to show that 
the, the characters aren't either good or evil. Everybody's a little bit of both, yes. truthfully. I mean, we all try to not be evil, <laughs> or at least most of us do. But <laughs> um, um, I, I did have a friend say to me, you didn't give Victor enough faults. And I said, well, I gave him really bad table manners, okay? And, uh, you know, he's a messy eater, I, I, you know? So I, I just thought that was funny. She was like, I liked him too much. Sorry, sorry. You made him a little believable. <laughs> well, that's why I gave him bad table manners. <laughs> <laughs> so Maddie has a follow-up question to that. Were you consistently writing for uh, 15 years? Oh, heck no. And that was because of my children. It turns out when you give birth, you have to take care of them for years. <laughs> no, I, I had three kids and I was working full time while I was writing it, but I did hide from them often in the laundry room to try and continue to write and close the door and they would find me. But, you know. <laughs> Mom, you're at it again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mommy, I'll be there in a minute. No, I, I, just, I just one paragraph. Right, right. <laughs> Um, were there, uh, Justin asks, were there any characters in your book that you suddenly decided to add while uh, you were writing or was each character planned and created before the writing started? I don't know how I did it, but everybody was there in my head the whole time. Now, I'm not going to say that when Victor was in Washington, that a character didn't pop in, but all the main characters and all the secondary and the tertiary, they were there in my head from the beginning. Like my husband said, my head must be kind of a scary place because all this stuff comes out of it and he doesn't know how, and it worries him a little bit. So I, I don't know, it, it just, it, it makes sense to me. And you can ask any other writer when it's coming out, you can't type fast enough to keep up. It is so much fun. I'm going to make everybody out there want to be a writer, aren't I? <laughs> it is so much fun. Well, Pulani is fascinated by the fact that it took 15 years and you did continue to write. You were at it. You know, that is some dedication as well. And uh, she would like to know what personal lessons did you learn from the whole process and journey of writing the book in general? Um, that rewriting is your friend. <laughs> Editors are your friends. Grammar is not your friend. Grammar has changed since I took it in fifth grade. I learned that from my editor. Um, and, you know, when I created these people, I really, when bad things did happen to them, I actually felt bad. Sometimes I'd have to get away from my computer because I felt it so deeply. But I mean, I had to do it. That was a story I was going to tell. I mean, it's a civil war. So not everything good happens, shall we say. Um, but I, I really, really, I lived the characters. I still live them. If I may ask a question, I'm intrigued. Uh, you know, language is constantly evolving, right? So um, the language back then and the language now, have, did you kind of, you know, did you think that you had to include certain words, you know, uh, to necessarily describe something, uh, and if you changed it, that it would lose authenticity. What you know? How was your you know constant? Um, I would say were you constantly at a tug of war with you know certain vocabulary? Yes, I tried, and I'm not sure I succeeded, but I did try to make their speech the best way that I can imagine. And all we have is letters, and we all know that we don't write a letter the way we speak. It, it, yes. um, and obviously I tried not to use any, you know, um, 20th century terms, but it, it was, I had the most trouble trying to have my non uh, English speakers speak because I was afraid I made them look sound silly when I would put in a French word. And it was painful for me to have uh, Selena's mother speak who was French. I didn't want to make her look silly. I was not trying to do a caricature of a French speaker. So um, I didn't have trouble with the Spanish, though, because the Spanish I understood. So the couple of Spanish phrases I had in there. But um, I found that very difficult. And I don't you you readers can tell me if I if I succeeded or not. I, I felt very 
I, I didn't want to insult the French language or French speakers, and I didn't want her to look silly, but when I can't have the entire sentence in French because people can't, don't, the English world, you know, in America, not many French speakers, but to make it sound like she had a French accent was, I found that extremely difficult. So, and of, of course I'm writing a French novel again. So I, and these girls are coming from France. I'm like, why do I keep doing this to myself? I, I don't know. That was hard. But I'm sure it was also a very rewarding journey because, you know, language is fun. Well, my editor and I had used, I'll admit it, the French and um, English dictionary and Google Translate. And then my editor got a hold of it and she would send me notes back with like, LOL, what did you mean to say here? And I'm like, well, I was trying to say because she actually speaks French. And I was like, oh, oh God, was that, that was that bad? Okay. So <laughs> I ended up taking more of the French out because I, I did not feel like I did a good job with it. So I, 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 I tried to give the flavor of the native French speaker, but it was very hard for me. That's interesting to know though. Uh, and I'm sure uh, you, I'm sure you must've picked up a little French vocabulary in the process. It's similar to um, I believe Spanish is also a Romance language. Yes, they are, but they are very different. I can say uh, mon petit chien, which means my little dog, but that's about all I can do. <laughs> <laughs> all I, right. Yeah, I was not good. Alicia, Alicia wants to know um, if you could pick one favorite book and favorite genre, what would it be? Well, the favorite book would be William Henry Hudson's The Green Mansions. If anybody's ever read that with uh, Rima, the bird girl, it's a fascinating novel. But anyway, um, it, it, would, it would be gothic romance for genre. I mean, you know, who doesn't love Wuthering Heights and Jane Eyre? Agreed. I did. I made my daughter read Jane Eyre. I got her the abridged version when she was about 12 and she fell in love with it, so. Nothing like having your mad wife locked in the attic. <laughs> okay, one more comment. Uh, Heather says, I'm still reading your book and it is so immersive and real. Uh, I am loving the feel I get from this book. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Well, I, I, like I said, I just wanted people to have fun with it, um, learn a little bit and maybe have the characters stay with them a little bit longer than when the last page is closed. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff wants to know, uh, now that you're more focused on writing, how long until your next book? I'm going to try and have it out in November. We go Ooh. from 15 years to one year <laughs> because the children have left the house. Thank you for leaving finally. And um, I've retired. I, I don't work anymore. So it leaves a lot more time when you're not um, working, you know, eight hours a day trying to make a living to be able to write. So I, I'm very blessed that I'm able to quit early-ish and write. Well, we're glad to be able to read one more book coming out soon. <laughs> It'll be a trilogy. It'll be three, but it won't be three in November. I'm, I'm going to try and do one a year. Um, I don't know if I can do it because the research is incredible but it'll be the same town it'll just be the same town 100 years 200 years 300 years so that's that's the goal that sounds very interesting so looking forward to that erin well, uh, commented uh, she she loves gothic romance as well and uh, so does griffin uh, again who doesn't love heathcliff i mean come on <laughs> Even Frankenstein was kind of handsome it, before he started to decay. <laughs> and Kylie asks, on the note of portraying language barriers, uh, was that the most difficult part to write or were, were there more difficult aspects? I don't write action very well. I have an author friend who wrote a fight scene between two guys wrestling and you can see the punches and this. And I found I can't write action because mm -hmm. I'll have the leg or the arm in the wrong place. It just didn't work for me. Uh, my favorite thing to write was dialogue, which is probably why there's so much. I can get in each character's head 
and have them say things that make sense, but from their own point of view. And, and dialogue for a lot of writers is a little bit more difficult. I, I've noticed there's less dialogue, there's more um, just narration, and mine is heavy on dialogue. I wanted the characters to tell the story, not me. Well, I uh, am told we're running short on time. We would love to continue uh, conversing, but I think we'll wrap up with just about one or two more questions. Um, Elizabeth asks, besides your mother, did you ever ask anyone else for advice about the story? Um, did you discuss the storyline with anyone? No. It was all mine always. Now I made a lot of people read it. <laughs> my poor family um, and my poor friend, but no, it was, no, I didn't want their input. They would have they would have tried to talk me out of doing certain things. <laughs> I know it. Yeah, this way I think it's it's it is entirely your uh, you know the way you would have wanted it to be, right? Yes. So yes. okay. So last question: uh, What is the main takeaway you'd like for the readers to get from your book? That love and forgiveness are incredibly powerful and maybe death is not the end. All right. Uh, we've had a fantastic session. We want, we would have loved to, you know, have a longer conversation, uh, but unfortunately we're running short on time. Uh, all of you, thank you for joining us. Well, thank and you, Dara. Thank you so much. Uh, we've enjoyed, some of us have already read Victor's Blessing. Um, we're pretty sure you are going to enjoy it. Um, we've already pinned it in the comments. If you want to go check out the book, you can go click on that link, check out the book. Uh, Barbara, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Dara. Thank Bye. you. Bye.